Hi guys, welcome back to the Earthy Delights podcast. Today we have a really special guest, Dr. Gaetan Chavalier, the director of the Earthing Institute. We're going to talk to him about earthing, a fairly new phenomenon, at least by scientific standards. Dr. Gaetan's experiments and findings on bioelectrical changes generated by earthing have opened a new frontier of electrophysiological research into the striking differences between grounded and non-grounded human beings. Dr. Chavalier holds a PhD in engineering physics from the University of Montreal. He is a core faculty member and former director of research at the California Institute of Human Science in Encinitas, California. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to him, and I hope you enjoy and learn something from this podcast. We certainly did. Without further ado, here's Dr. Gaetan Chavalier. Dr. Gaetan Chavalier, thank you for coming onto the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. First and foremost, we'd like to ask you, what's the crack? Well, you know, we're uh, doing very well here in Southern California, beautiful San Diego. And um, so I'm ready for your questions. Beautiful. Uh, we usually like to ask our guests just to tell us a bit about themselves before we, we tip on to the, the main topics. Um, for those in, unfamiliar with you, can, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I graduated from the University of Montreal in engineering physics, and I went to work in nuclear fusion for some time. And uh, that brought me to Los Angeles at UCLA, where I worked for some time in nuclear fusion as a specialist in spectroscopy, which is basically the specialty of analyzing light to find out um, the elements that uh, compose the light. So basically, by analyzing the light of a, the sun, for example, or any star, you can get information on which elements there are in there. So that my specialty was to analyze uh, the light uh, coming out from nuclear fusion plasma so that we can see what type of particles and in, in atoms were moving in the plasma. So anyway, so I was doing that for some time. And then I had um, a change of career in the uh, early 90s. And because um, I always was interested in yoga and spirituality. And I had uh, the uh, someone give me an article about a Japanese scientist, Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama. He's a, a Shinto priest also. Oh, cool. And he talked about his research he was also a specialist in in parapsychology. He worked with uh, J.B. Ryan at uh, Duke University, who is considered one of the foremost parapsychologists in the in the time. Okay. And uh, so I heard his research on trying to prove the existence of meridians, chakras, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He had built equipment, special machines, and stuff, and I, I was fascinated. And I just wrote, to, there, there was an, uh, an address, and I just wrote to Japan saying, is there any way I can help in any way? Just I was thinking, you know, this would be a hobby of interest of mine. Uh -huh. and, um, but I didn't know I would even get an answer, you know. So, but I did. And I got a last letter from one of Dr. Mutima's associates telling that Dr. Mutima will be giving a lecture in uh, Santa Monica in a yoga studio, which was not far from where I live. So I went there and that changed my life uh, because uh, even though it was difficult to understand Dr. Motima with his Japanese and accent, Japanese and German, because he also lived in Germany. Okay. Uh, I still went to him after that and I told him, you know, I'm interested what, what kind of... Uh, how can I help? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm starting a school in, uh, in San Diego. And it's, a gra it's going to be a graduate school. And uh, I would need uh, to have uh, someone with a uh, background in, in electricity and magnetism that could teach that to my uh, students so that they can understand my machines. And I was like, wow, this is interesting because when I was in the engineering school, as a grad student, I was teaching electricity and magnetism to uh, 
the beginning engineers there. So I said, yes. So I started teaching a class. So I was still at UCLA. I started teaching a class, uh, driving down to Encinitas, actually, which was about two hours drive. And every Sunday I would drive down two hours, teach four hours, and come back. I did that for about a year, and that and uh, and that he offered me a position, and that was a big decision because now I'm going from mainstream science into you know frontier science, and in those days in the early '90s, all of this uh, research in you know frontier science. And, biofield and all of that stuff was like just burgeoning. And so we were like going, uh, I was going in woo science or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but I knew it was my calling. So I decided to make the plunge and make the move. And so I joined the staff at the California Institute for Human Science. So um, I, I, I had three students in my class uh, when I started teaching, which was fall of 1992. And I didn't know at the time, but I learned later, it was actually the only three students of the class, of, of, of the entire school. And uh, that was the first quarter of the school. Now the school has grown tremendously, has its own building and everything. But um, but I was there and I was uh, became director of research there. And uh, in around the year 2003, about 10 years later, there was this gentleman who came talking about the benefits of being grounded and <clears throat> that they were doing research. They just started in the year 2000 to do research on their own with a nurse. And because nobody would, he went to UCLA, nobody would pay attention to what he was saying, that grounding is good for you. So... I myself thought, hmm, well, that's so simple as a concept, you know, that it would have been discovered 100 years ago. Mm. I didn't know that it was actually in Germany, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, so I thought, I thought that, well, you know, I don't know about this. But it would have, I would have left it like this if it was not for the fact that <clears throat> one of his associates came to me and said, we want to sponsor a research project by you as a school. I mean, what we did is more qualitative, asking people, you know, questions, have the answer, but you have instruments. So we're really willing to pay for our research. So we are an open school, effectively ourselves being kind of in the frontier of science and say, oh, sure, we'll do it. And I was just astounded by the results uh, that we got. Um, there was improvement in brain function, uh, Especially we found something about autoregulation of the muscle of the body and different things that were happening that was showing that earth and grounding really relax the body at a physiological level and um, change the function of the physiology of a person. But I still was skeptical because um, maybe there was a ground loop in the uh, the instrument because the instrument was plugged into you know, a power outlet, so we needed power. Mm -hmm. So, but we had the opportunity to repeat the experiment with um, a device that actually was battery powered and was sending uh, the data through a fiber optic to uh, the computer. <clears throat> no possibility of ground loop or anything like that. And um, I found that has good results. So, and then, we're recruiting subjects in, uh, for that project, and uh, some of my friends participated. And one of my friends has uh, had arthritis in the hands. I didn't know that. They never told me, never showed any sign of it. And he said, yeah, pretty bad. So I always said, pretty bad. So from a scale from zero to 10, how bad is it? Zero that, you know, no pain, or 10 you're willing, you know, to jump off the bridge because it's so untellable. He said, I'm at eight. Really? Oh, wait, wait. I had no clue from his behavior that he was so much in pain. Okay. So we put patches in his hands 
And when we're chatting, he kept asking questions me too. And after about an uh, what would we say forty minutes, we uh, we asked him, "How are you doing?" He said, uh, "Well, my pain is much better." Uh, so how much better? So one hand it came down to three, and the other two. And he said to us, "No medication, no medication does that." So this is pretty astounding. Wow. So. All of this, you know, finally convinced me this is real. <laughs> <laughs> so this is yeah. real. Everything yeah. really works, and I have many more stories since there. And and we found that the worse the person's condition, the more dramatic in general the improvements. Wow! And Gaetan, um, we'll definitely get into those stories because I think Jim and I would love to hear some more success stories for sure. But bef- before we kind of get into into the nooks and crannies of earthing or grounding, could you just explain what it is to someone who has maybe never even heard of this concept before, <clears throat> doesn't know what it is? What What is earthing? What is grounding? Earthing or grounding is simply uh, being in direct physical contact with the earth. Not like, you know, when you do... Uh, Meditation, you see you ground yourself and you imagine you're in contact with the Mm -hmm. earth and stuff like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about physical contact with the earth, your skin touching the surface of the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, when we say that, uh, like walking barefoot and stuff like that, when we say that, we found that it's there's a substitute possible. You can, for example, have a metal rod in the ground, have a wire <clears throat> coming to your home and have a grounding mat, for example, a conducting mat that you put your feet on, you're going to be grounded still. Your inner reality is still in contact with the earth. What we found is that the earth is a battery. I don't know if it's time to go into this, but and the earth actually has a, an electric charge. And when you touch the ground, you get to be in the same electric potential as the earth. And that means electrons will come to the, into your body. And we use these electrons to uh, reset our body systems and to determine where are bioelectrical beings. And we just like any electrical system, we need a ground to determine the voltage between the different, you know, operating systems of our body. So when we don't have that, then we develop over time autoimmune diseases because the immune system works from electric charge. The immune system kills bacteria by engulfing them or throwing acid to them, which is an acid is positively charged, very highly positively charged. Right. So we developed this system because of our contact with the, the earth. See, I said the earth is, a, is, is a electrically charged, and it's like a battery. So a yeah, battery has two poles, positive pole and negative pole. <clears throat> the, the earth, too. The negative pole is the surface of the earth. The positive pole is about 60, 100 kilometers uh, up in the sky. It's uh, a layer of the atmosphere that is called the ionospheres, ionosphere. We get recharged, basically, by being in contact with the earth. We recharge just like a battery gets recharged. You know, when you have a rechargeable battery and you put it on the recharger, what a recharger has done is giving electrons to the battery or, you know, reseparating the charge so that you can use the battery again. So that's what happens to us. We get recharged by having the electrons coming in. And am I correct in thinking that basically the reason a lot of us, because obviously back back when we were Neanderthals chasing animals across the plains, um, we would go barefoot. But nowadays with the rubber of our souls, is that what's creating the barrier between the and stopping us from earthing at the end of the day? It's one of the big barriers because we're all on rubber or plastic sole shoes all day. Right. We live in an apartment complex made of wood, which is not conducting. And then we step into cars with rubber tires. Mm-hmm. And even when we go out, you know, like uh, running, 
were running in running shoes with, um, you know, rubber soles. And we never, practically never in contact with the earth. Yeah. And um, I live in a, a, here in, in San Diego in a surfing town where people go surf all the time. And it's amazing to see how the surfer are dedicated to surfing. And they say it's their lifeline. You know, they go at 6 a.m. in the winter when the temperature is like uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 10 degrees Celsius, you know. They still go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they feel recharged. And there's a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that the charge on the surface of the Earth gets transferred to the ocean. And being in the ocean is really the best way to get to be grounded. By far, because the saline water is conducting, it's all over your body. You absorb electrons from all over. That's once. The other thing is you get the sun rays also, so which give you vitamin D. Not only that, but you also breathe, uh, you know, negative ions. We talk about the properties of negative ions and stuff. Well, mm -hmm. we also breathe negative ions because the water evaporated from the ocean is. Uh, is a bit humid and contains negative ions. So you're breathing that. So no wonder these these surfers feel great after a surfing, you know, spree mm. there, and they don't yeah. want to give it up. Yeah, I'm not a surfer, but I try. You know, <laughs> to, I, I was, to, it's interesting because I I was going to ask actually two things. I was going to ask is number one, is there kind of an optimal time? um to ground daily or weekly um because i think a lot of people hear this and they automatically think oh well for this to happen i need to then throw away all of my shoes and just live a barefoot life for the rest of my days otherwise there's no point point. and then the other question i wanted to ha ask you was are there any uh, you kind of already answered it but are there any surfaces that are better for you in terms of grounding than others so i'm imagining you know someone who goes for a walk along the beach compared to someone who goes to a field or maybe in a rocky kind of area are, are any surfaces more conducive to bent more beneficial grounding okay first of all mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you touch the the earth wherever you are on the planet you're going to have the benefits of grounding even in the okay. desert okay okay that said, there's some surfaces, of course, that the best. I already mentioned that the best is to be in the ocean. You know, mm -hmm. the ocean is the best. And in fact, the best place on Earth would be the Dead Sea because there's so much salt in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you want to be naked in the Dead Sea, this is the <laughs> ultimate grounding experience. And okay. actually, I know someone who had the opportunity to do that. And he said it was a fantastic. He didn't know about grounding. So he went there just to, to I don't know, it was in a trip in the Middle uh, East and mm -hmm. in Israel. And he went and tried it and he felt amazingly recharged. And people are seeing that. You go and bait in the Dead Sea, people say, this is a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know why, but when you learn about grounding, he said, oh, okay, I think I got it. So mm -hmm. it's basically the grounding experience. But you don't have to go to that extent. You know, wherever <laughs> you are, you can... Uh, so the best is um, being in an ocean... Next would be in the lake. Uh, next after that being on walking in the grass, you know, especially with the dew in the morning. Mm. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you have a rocky surface somewhere and you do mountain climbing and you are barefoot, you're still grounded. Okay. And what we found also in our research is if you're a healthy person, you don't need to ground 24-7. You can get get grounded about half an hour a day, and that's all you need to maintain your health. If you're not healthy, you're going to need a lot more. Okay. Uh, especially if you have conditions, um, certain conditions that affect the nervous system, like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. Uh, you're going to need a lot of grounding to get really improved. We we work with people with multiple sclerosis, so 
a little more closely than others. And uh, we found that there's an initial improvement with an hour of grounding, but then it plateaued very quickly. The person is not. So we found that they need about 16 hours of grounding a day to really like function normally, especially if they have had, you know, uh, advanced uh, multiple sclerosis. Okay. So that tells you. So um, for me, you know, um, I mean, maybe I'm anticipating a question, but I do, <laughs> you know. <laughs> in my busy life. Go ahead, please anticipate away. <laughs> <laughs> is that, well, you know, everything is really the best benefit with the least work. Just sleep grounded. That's it. You just sleep grounded and you're good for the day. And that's and how. And how is that done? Because people are going to think that that means they now have to sleep in a field or sleep in the ocean. So right. <laughs> you no, know, there's some yeah. products that uh, yeah, like exactly grounding sheets, and they are very comfortable. And um, and uh, grounding mats. And yeah, so there's many of them. So you can just you can just sleep grounded with in the comfort of your bed and yeah. not having any problem. But I found also beneficial to be grounded when I work at a computer. Like, for example, yeah. I'm at my computer right now, and I use <clears throat> a grounding uh, mat as mm. my, uh, my mouse pad, and also I put my keyboard on it. And I have another one on my feet, so I put my feet on the grounding mat. So I found I got less tired. Uh, I have more energy to work on my computer because I found and many people found that working around computer um, has an effect on your energy. You, you definitely yeah. can feel it. So yeah. uh, being grounded has been uh, a great boon for me. You know, it's been helpful. Can, yeah, I, can you, sorry, Seb? No, I was going to say, I actually have a grounding mat um, that I use because I also like you, I work at the computer well, eight to 10 hours a day. And so I have yeah. it underneath the, underneath the desk. And I don't I've know got, if you um, know something, but the, so for, for me, yeah, because uh, I also spend eight to 10 hours a day on the computer. Yeah. Uh, when I notice it the most, I think is when I do it. Um, so I not, I have a park right next to me and I go for a run. And then after I, I, broke my ankle once playing rugby and normally when i do kind of cardio stuff it after a run or something it will flare up and it can be a bit stiff and i found that what if i go for a run and then i basically once i finish the run stay in the park and i just take off my socks and, and shoes stay on the grass for half an hour just put something on my phone or listen to the birds and the trees or whatever it may be i find that the day after or that same day my ankle doesn't hurt as much and also, I also find that I return to my um, resting like heartbeat and my breath returns a lot quicker than yeah. if I finish the run and go straight home and have a shower and then go out and do something else. I still feel like I'm still trying to, maybe because I'm not that fit, but I'm still trying to like catch up. Whereas when I kind of do that earthing after the run, I find that I recover a lot quicker. Yeah. And we have uh, lots of evidence on that. You know, <clears throat> we have Jeff Spencer, a chiropractor who worked with uh, the American team at the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he, uh, interestingly, that each time that he was um, in charge of the team uh, and he started to ground them to have them recoup for their day, the team was winning. Every uh, in, uh, five, six years he was involved in. In the middle of that, he was not there and the team didn't re win. And so, uh, and it was evil, even evil. There was one, one anecdotal thing that happened is one of the uh, cyclists somehow didn't stop. There was a car in front of him and went into the car and went into the, uh, the window and um, get a piece of glass that, you know, scratches his arm. And the doctors look at that. And it was pretty bad. They put stitches and stuff. And they said, he's out of the of the race. Mm -hmm. There's no way he can continue. And so Jeff said, give me 24 hours. Uh, the doctor said, well, if you want 24 hours, we will give it. But, you know, I don't know what that will change. So what yeah. he did, 
is uh, put patches, grounding patches, because the grounding patches are really the best conducting uh, material out there, you know, or I would say grounding uh, product. Uh, if you have if you have a, a need for a, you know a region of uh, inflammatory pain that is really mm -hmm. bothering you, so what he did he put patches all around, each one at their own wire and grounding, and he wrapped the the person into uh, a slipping bag, but a grounding slipping bag that was made for especially for the Tour de France people, mm -hmm. and uh, slept there twenty four hours. And you can see, I think it's in the book, you can see in 24 hours, uh, there was a big change in the uh, healing of the wound. And so he went back to the doctors and he said, well, I don't know what you did, but uh, we will allow him to continue. So he did continue and finish the race. So incredible. Uh, incredible. And that's what yeah. I'm saying. When, when there's something dramatic happen, you mean you have more dramatic effect from grounding. For me, see, I didn't feel a big change when I slept grounded and stuff. A bit more energy and stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. I was feeling fine. Uh, but I noticed certain things. For example, I had a problem with a tube. And I had a bridge here, and it fell off. And uh, and the doctor, the, the dentist, went and, and looked at this and said, well, your tooth is gone. It's been, you know, the inside of the tooth is gone and you have nothing there. Uh, but what was surprised is there was no inflammation. You didn't feel anything and you should have been in tremendous pain. I said, no, I didn't feel anything. So he was surprised that I didn't have any pain and just, you know, so he took the tooth out and it, it's um, fine. So that's small things like that that tells you, yeah, you know, Something yeah. is going on here. It, it, it's maintaining my health. It's maintaining my immune system at, at, in the best shape. I rarely have the flu, if ever. You know? Yeah. Um, so anyway. And, and with people who have <clears throat> more um, more serious illnesses, you mentioned people like mul multiple sclerosis or, or Parkinson's, which is almost kind of seen as like a, a death penalty. That once you have that, it's just a you're just going to go downhill and there's nothing really they can do. They can maybe slow it down, but pff, after that, there's not really much they can do. What, what does grounding, you know, you said if they could do it 16 hours a day, then that's the best. If someone can do that, I saw someone with multiple sclerosis. I think they had like a grounding wheelchair, I believe, um, or something like that. What does, what can grounding actually help in, in some in an illness that is that serious? Well, so, we have systems inside our body that are mm -hmm. dedicated to maintaining our health. Yeah. Uh, we have repair systems all over the, all over in every organ and crook and nana, nanny of the, of the body. So what earthing does is give the energy for these systems to function properly. I don't know, I don't want to get too technical, but <laughs> every cells yeah. have powerhouse inside of them. That's our call mitochondria. Okay. okay. And these mitochondria produce a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Mm -hmm. That molecule is the gasoline of our body. It's the energy source. So, <laughs> in order to produce that, the mitochondria needs two things. It needs oxygen from our, our breathing, and it needs electrons from the earth. And because the energy is always transferred by electrons. So what happens is that molecules get charged with energy of the electron, an excited state, electrons mm -hmm. inside the molecules that have a lot of energy. And it gets transferred to wherever is needed by special molecules and get consumed there, just like a car consumes gas, and gets the repair mechanism or anything that needs to happen, you know, to function better. So whatever the problem we have, 
grounding will help. It will help because it helps get energy into everybody's systems. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember, you know, some people say, well, you know, there's no universal panacea. Well, that might be the truth, but we're built, you know, like any other, we're built against certain principles. You violate those principles and you get, you pay for it. You have no, you're lacking vitamin C. I don't know what you care, what kind of treatment, but if you don't get vitamin C, you're not going to get much better. So, because the scurvy, you know, that disease that they had when you don't have. Yeah, scurvy, yeah. Scurvy, yes. Yeah. So it has multiple effect happen, and you look at that says just one molecule will, you know, get all. It'll do this. Into. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like it's not a panacea, a universal panacea. We just need to know how the body works, what it needs. Give it to it. The body knows what to do. Try, try. One of the problem with our medical system, and it's fading, and it's showing that it's a, a dead-end concept. Trying, It's trying to do things for the body. Mm-hmm. Wrong concept. You'll never be able to do, you know, the whole thing unless you build an entirely artificial body yeah. that you know everything of it. You'll never be able to. What the best we can do is give the body a chance to heal itself, give all the intimate nutrition and everything and conditions so that the body can heal itself. This is the best medicine. So grounding is just part of it. It's not the whole thing. I don't mm-hmm. want to say that just ground yourself, forget you can go and eat hamburgers and yeah, drink, start drink all day long. And you're okay. No, that's not yeah. true. That's mm-hmm. not true. You still have to have a good diet. You still have, you know, to have clean air and stuff like that. So it's like, you know, a car, you give gas, it works, you know, as it intended to do, but it's not going to be able to do everything. You know, you cannot not have a, uh, you know, a small Volkswagen, uh, you know, trailing a huge trailer, you know, even though it's function at its maximum, there's limit yeah. to what it can do. So yeah. our body is the same. It functions as it's designed to function. But if you over it with toxins and all kinds of things, eventually it's not going to happen. So in the past, what was happening is that the hygiene was very poor. So people were not you know, having bacteria. They were dying of infectious diseases. So now we found what are infectious diseases. We had, you know, means of de- dealing with them. Hygiene improve, and now we're not dying of that. We're dying of lack of contact with the earth. Any degenerative disease that uh, I mean, it's fascinating. I watched the progress of that when I started working in this field in the early nineties. Mm-hmm. There was very little research on inflammation. And then by the year 2000, they found that cardiovascular system, the plaque formation, needs inflammation to happen. Then they found diabetes and inflammatory disease. And then you have all these autoimmune disease also that have an inflammatory component, Alzheimer's, autism even, uh, most cancers, uh, all uh, arteriosclerosis, you know, and arthritis. It's all inflammation based. You kill inflammation in the body, these diseases have almost no chance of happening. Mm. I mean, this is a major, major discovery. And we found the best natural way of killing inflammation is to be grounded. This is incredible. It really is incredible. And um, for people uh, who are excited about this, uh, I have a two part question. One, what would you say to someone who is living in an apartment or surrounded by uh, concrete? Uh, what, what would be the first steps for them to begin grounding? And second, is there a correct way to walk barefoot? I, I know when I walk barefoot compared to when I walk with shoes, it's quite different. Like my, my feet, I'm sure, I think you know what, you, what I mean. But the mechanics. My feet feel, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so those are two questions I'd love to ask you. Yeah. Well, when you're in an apartment complex, um, unless you live, live in a very old one, 
the modern apartments have very good grounding systems. So if you go back in the 60s and you plug your appliance into the wall, you had only two slots. That's it. Mm -hmm. But since they found that there were too many injuries, people get electrocuted and stuff like that because the appliances were not grounded. You have a toaster, for example, it is made of metal. And you have mm -hmm. a live wire that touched the surface. Mm -hmm. And you're in the kitchen and uh, you're washing something and you touch the toaster. You can die. Mm -hmm. You can die. But it happened too many times in those days. So what they did, they added a third wire, which is going to rods that are planted into the ground. And those wires actually go into the toaster and ground the surface of it. So that even if the live wires touch it, it's going to create a large current that will trigger, trigger the breakers and you'll just lose electricity for the time. And you'll know something happened, but you're not going to die. This grounding system is a very good grounding system. You can use it to ground yourself, okay? The only thing is that you have old houses that are retrofitted. You know, they put the grounding system after, and sometimes the electrician will connect the neutral in the ground, and there's some problems that could happen there, and there could be electricity on the ground wire. So you just need to check for that. Once you know you have a good grounding system in your house, you can use it and uh, to ground yourself. And um, some companies send, sell a grounding uh, checker, you know, a, a ground checker or an outlet checker. So they can check if you have a good ground. So check your ground before using it in any home. Okay? okay. But you can do that. Even if you are, some people uh, ask me, Oh, I live on the 30th floor, 30th floor, <laughs> yeah. 30th floor of a high-rise apartment building. Yeah. Can I ground there? Yes, you can. It's still going to work. The electrons will move up there, no problem. So, mm. yeah. So, uh, the most easiest way is to sleep grounded. But the next best one that you can do is have a grounding mat. And that's where people start. A grounding mat is cheap. It's versatile. You can use for anything. You can even sleep with it. It does almost everything that you want. Yeah. And it's very cheap, like 70, 60 bucks, 70 bucks. Yeah. And you can bring it when you travel and all the things. So, so that's where many people start. But if you have injury, for example, really acute injury somewhere, I would highly recommend you put a patch there. I mean, you can rub your mat around it. It will help a lot. But the healing will be a little faster with the patch. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the patch have uh, some kind of a gel in the middle. Uh -huh. They're like EKG type patches. And so, they're so they are adapted. The, the, the impedance, impedance or the resistance of those, they adapted to the re resistance of our skin so that you get better, faster penetration. So that's why in the book, they are called the magic patches because mm -hmm. there was a lady who was suffering of an elbow injury for a long, long time. Put a patch there, five minutes, the pain was gone. So the patches are good for emergency situation. You have like, you have a toothache, for example, and you can't go to the dentist right now and you're in pain. Put a patch there, you'll be surprised how fast it will it will diminish the pain mm -hmm. so um some people like to sleep grounded they don't they they can't afford you know the whole sheet and stuff you can also you and they don't the mat is moving too much and goes here and there <laughs> yeah they use a strap you can use a a, a wristband or ankle band you can sleep like mm -hmm. that too Okay. So there's different ways adapted to different people needs. Yeah. Uh, some people like to be able to move around and be grounded. So you can have like uh, a, a, a band, a, a wristband or a band around your ankle and have a cable that stretch and you can move around and still be grounded in your home. 
even if you don't have a grounded floor floor you know mm. so uh, it's depend what you want to do you know and how you plan to your life <clears throat> and then to, to follow up on Jim's question about how, how does the mechanics of walking barefoot change compared yeah. to when we walk with with trainers because I've heard a lot of people actually that I think they blame Nike I think Nike is the person. <laughs> it's because not the fault of Nike. Every shoe. Every <laughs> yeah, time. they said they say that the Nike shoe apparently was one of the, the Nike Cortez. Apparently, was one of the first one where it put up the heel and yeah. increased the heel, which then made us now we do it subconsciously. I think, but we walk on our heel first and then put the ball of our foot down second. And apparently, the natural way is actually almost the opposite. Yes. So if you. If you run with shoes, what was found is if you run and you have running shoes, when you run, you will put your heel first down mm -hmm. and then you run that way. And that's the way with shoes. But when you run barefoot, you can't do that. You, you will find that the natural way that we run when we are barefoot is that The balls of the feet, you know, first touch and they create some kind of cushioning, natural mm. cushioning. And they found that runners who weren't barefoot have much less knee injuries. What happened is that when you run and you, the heel touch first, the whole shock of that, the concussion of buying ground, touching the ground suddenly give a shock wave that goes and is absorbed mainly in the knee region. So mm -hmm. that's why runners have often knee problems, but barefoot runners don't have that. That's the natural way that we were. The, the spring effect of having the balls touching first versus the heel makes apparently a, a, a big, big difference in runners. Okay, brilliant. And what what are your hopes for the future for for the earthing movement? Where do you see this going? What would you um like what would you advise to people who are listening and how could we maybe implement this into our lives better as a as a society? Well, one is um to to sleep grounded. Sleep grounded every night. So maybe have only grounding sheets, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean The other thing is to have uh, floors in our homes that are grounded and shoes that are grounding us too. So if we have grounding shoes and socks, grounding floors, grounding carpets and sleep grounded, that's where we want to go. And when we do that, you know, uh, the society will be very different. Our expense Uh, you know, national mm -hmm. national expense on healthcare is amazing. You know, it's like off the roof. It would go down dramatically because people yeah. will be so much healthier. So, I, 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 how do you see the? Do you think this is becoming more widespread? Do you think it's because you said at the very start that when you started this all those years ago, it was a bit of a woo-woo science and people it thought was. of it as this. Hip, it it, I think some people, I, I mean, because I tell people that I have this earthing mat and I try to take my shoes off after I've gone for a run. And I still see that some of my friends look at me and think, oh, Seb's turned into a, into a hipster or, or a hippie or something. And right. this is all like peace and love and blah, blah, blah. Right, but right. Do, do you think that it's becoming kind of more accepted in the scientific world now that you've got all these studies that prove the benefits of it? Yes, yes, it, it is. So we have about 25 studies published. We have many commentaries by scientists like Jim Ashman. And we're attracting more and more attention. So we've done our own work. We've done about 25 studies. Uh, we had some other researchers starting to take that over. There's a group at Penn State that did a research on premies. There's no more fragile human being than a premies, you know, that is mm -hmm. like 10 weeks per, uh, before term. These are very fragile. And the problem with this premies is that there's something call um, some kind of necrosis mm -hmm. that happen in their intestine when they are in incubators and they didn't know understand why these baby would die 
So they grounded them just to see what happened. And they found that this condition goes away when the, ba- the little babies are grounded. The incubators, we found, are incredibly uh, uh, par- uh, you know, uh, regions for the little baby with incredibly mm-hmm. high electromagnetic fields. That certainly creates something to these little infants. By grounding them, you're you know, blocking those uh, most of those electromagnetic fields and it help the child, the little one. There's no more proof, you know, better proof that everything works than on little primies, the most fragile mm-hmm. human being that cannot even, you know, uh, understand what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this thing works. So we have other researchers. Now, I just got someone from New Zealand who is asking mm-hmm. us that they want to start building um, um, houses with grounded floors. How would they do about it? You see? Mm. So the concept is there. And yeah. uh, and uh, once we have grounded floors, we, get, we're, we will have made a great progress because a lot of people stay on barefoot. And so we would be grounded. It would be, it would become, we want, Basically, grounding to be part of the light, like it used to be. Mm-hmm. Just bring it back to the <laughs> yeah. part of the light, like it used to be. That's all we're. That's all we want, you know. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and I mean, just before we let you go, just two last questions. The first of which is, what are your tips and tricks for um, keeping on top of your mental health and keeping everything in order? I feel like grounding is going to play a big part in that somehow. <laughs> Of course, grounding play a big part. <laughs> and especially, yeah. you know, uh, whatever work you do, uh, try to get some grounding during the time or in between during the breaks or something. For me, um, most of the time I work from home and I have, you know, a grounding mat that I use as a mouse pad. And also mm-hmm. I have one for my feet. So mm-hmm. I'm staying grounded when I work. I sleep grounded. And so I'm I'm doing my best, you know, to stay uh, grounded. But whatever you want to do, you can do. Bring a little mat, you know. If you work mm-hmm. at a place where there's a computer, bring a mat and you have shoes and socks. You don't even need to remove your socks. Just put your remove your shoes, put, put your feet with the socks on the, on the mat. And, um, and just try to keep grounded as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't have to do it, you know, like if you're healthy, you know, one hour a day would be enough for maintenance. You can do it at night. Mm-hmm. If you, one more tip I have is for travelers. Yeah. We travel okay. less these days. <laughs> yeah, of course. If you travel from um, New York to Dublin, for example, when you arrive in Dublin, yeah. you're going to be disoriented. Put your feet on the ground for 30 minutes. You're not going to have jet lag. Jet lag. Ah, jet lag. There we go. We have there you go. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, yeah. So, and yeah, then other the tricks like that that we developed, you know. Maybe it can help. Hope maybe even with hangovers. Does it? Ha- is there any proof of that? I think no. if you do that, then it'll be a bestseller. If it can help yeah. with hangovers, then the world will take it up. I think. Okay, so you're hired. So. <laughs> We're there we go. On that. <laughs> there we go. We'll do that one. Perfect. And um, last, lastly, where can people kind of either find you or find your, your website or more information about earthing? Um, now that they've listened to this, uh, what, what are the links that people can look up? Yes, the best link is the link to the Earthing Institute, which is okay. earthinginstitute.net. Okay. Okay. Earthing, like the word earthing yeah. institute. Yeah. Uh, all together, no space in between. Dot net. Okay. We have, you'll have all the studies, and you have all the frequently asked questions answered there, and you can leave questions for me to answer. So they go okay. directly to me. So I'll answer them <clears throat> myself. Okay. Okay. So That's perfect. Well, this way. 
yeah we'll put that we'll definitely put that link in the show notes so anyone who's listening can uh can find that link easy and ask the questions or find answers that there that maybe haven't been found in this podcast although i think we've answered most questions that would be asked. And there's no dumb uh, questions you know ask it there we ask go away. <laughs> ask away there you <laughs> go we have you have dr gaitan's permission ask away um <laughs> so thank you very much dr gaitan it's been an absolute pleasure to have you i know you're a busy man um but it's really been great to have you on and it's something that jim and i have implemented into our lives and we just want to spread the word and i think with your expertise and knowledge hopefully we can help help this movement um grow some even more thank you we appreciate your help any help that you we can get the, to get the word out is appreciated it's there's still a lot of people need to learn to learn about this hi guys thank you for listening to the podcast please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week, but until then, keep safe and have a good one.